All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to this seminar. Uh, hopefully, you can find a seat. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Kelly Zamudio from the University of Texas in Austin. And she is a, a new professor there, having moved there from Cornell um, after uh, a, a, an extensive time there in Cornell, where she became a distinguished professor, but is starting a new lab in Austin. Um, let's see. But a little bit of the background, um, Kelly was uh, a PhD student at the University of Washington, an undergrad at uh, UC Berkeley, and um, she um, had grew up in Brazil and now con continues to have a lot of her field work in Brazil. Um, there's a lot of things that Kelly does, but most of it's tied to um, herps, uh, so, you know, snakes and reptiles and frogs, and um, she's going to talk today about fungus, um, which is something that uh, I've, I've been working with her for um, maybe a dozen years, and it's been a, there's a lot I could say, but it's just been a wonderful um, association and collaboration, um, some, some great times in, in the field and some um, great research that we've been able to do together. Um, and, in that period, I've learned a, a whole lot about, um, about amphibians, and um, I'm really pleased to see Kelly's working so much on fungi. Um, and well, at, at just a couple of awards, she's a fellow of AAAS, and she run, won a, um, a, an award for um, her contributions to diversity at Cornell. And um, I think I, I well, I'll just close by saying um, I, I have so much faith in her as, as a scientist and a mentor that um, two of the people from our lab are now in her lab. That's Anat Bellison, former PhD student in our program, and Rebecca Clemens. And uh, I know that they're in very good hands. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly, and if you could join me in welcoming her. All right. Well, the sentiment, Tim, is completely reciprocal. I always talk about my, fam my favorite fungal biologist. Oh, <laughs> I always talk about my favorite fungal genomicist, like with affection. And I could, of course, never have done so many of these things. I've learned so much about chytrids from Tim, and uh, I've tried to teach him a little bit about frogs, but I probably learned more myself. So, everyone, this is my first. Um, in-person seminar since March 2020, and it's wonderful to be here. I had forgotten how fun it is to meet with people and talk to people and hear about their research, and I'm just really, really pleased that I was able to do that here. Uh, Anat and Rebecca, this is not picking me up very well. Is, this, is it okay? Can you guys hear? Okay. Anat and Rebecca are always saying, well, at Michigan, well, at Michigan, and so it's just great to see, be here in Michigan. So uh, they might even be online watching right now. So. Okay, um, so I hope a lot of this isn't too repetitive um, for you guys. You guys obviously have Tim, who's one of the leaders in the world on chytrid fungi, and I'm gonna be telling you a lot more of the story from my perspective, which is the frog perspective. Um, but of course, you'll see many things that you guys probably already know about, um, given that Tim is here. So um, I'm gonna tell you two parts to the story. The first will actually be uh, focused on the ecology and evolution of the chytrid fungi that we're interested in, uh, with a focus on a couple different systems. And then I'm going to switch gears and tell you about some more recent efforts where we've been trying to find some of the frogs that were lost um, in part to this, to this disease and to the emergence of this frog disease. And that, that has been um, trying to use environmental DNA to rediscover some of the frogs that we lost in Brazil. And so I will switch gears at some point and let you know that that is happening. Uh, but let me start with a little bit of background. Uh, so everybody's on the same page. We're interested in two, generally in two species of uh, chytrid fungi. One is called BD. You guys have probably all heard about this. The second one is a more recently discovered uh, flavor of Batrachochytrium, which is called Salamandriverans. We call it B-Sal for short. Uh, it tends to be a more of a salamander specialist as opposed to a frog specialist in terms of um, its host association. Both of them share, both of them are skin. Uh, fungi, they're basically uh, parasites on amphibians, and being that, they actually have evolved, you know, pathogenesis for amphibians. They live in places where amphibians like to live, 
Uh, they're actually keratinophilic, meaning they eat keratin from the skin, so, and, and in the process of doing so, they cause the disease, chytridiomycosis. Uh, they have zoospores, which are motile and move through the water. They can persist in the environment as long as it doesn't get too dry. Any moist environment is actually a good source. And the transmission happens from amphibian to amphibian okay? through, this, through this, environmental, um, this environmental source. Uh, salamandrivorans, we've known about detritivated batidas for quite a long time. Salamandrivorans salamandrivorans was just recently uh, described in 2014 and as far as we know it isn't actually present in the wild here in North America yet and for those of you who are herpetologists you might know that North America and especially the Appalachians and Mexico are centers of diversification for a lot of species of salamanders and so the arrival ultimately of this particular pathogen is actually something to really be worried about okay um, when we talk about, anybody who talks about uh, this pair of pathogens always gets these two questions, like, how bad really is it, right? And then the second question we get is, like, where did it come from? And so uh, the community of folks working on uh, fungi and also working on the hosts got together and tried to answer some of these questions, and see, these are some of the larger collaborations that Tim and I have worked on uh, with a very large community of, of biologists. So the answer to the quest, first question, how bad is it really? Um, at last count, what we figured, working with people from all over the world, is that BD has played a role in some level of decline for about 500 amphibian species. Now, there, there's some debate there, but it's, the number is somewhere around there. It's, it's relatively large. And over at least the last half century, 6.5% of amphibian has suffered some level of decline uh, thanks to these, one of these two pathogens. Now 6.5, just to give you some perspective, if we looked at all of mammals, what are there, like 66,000 some mammals maybe? I don't know exactly the number. But if we looked at all of mammals, this number would be equivalent to, say, losing all of ungulates, all of them. And if we were losing all the ungulates in the world, we would be losing our minds, right? And I think what happens here is that this number maybe doesn't seem very large, but we're talking about quite a lot of diversity overall in terms of frog diversification. Of these 500 species, 90 of them have known to, gone, to have completely gone extinct or they're presumed extinct in the wild. About 25% of them, 124 species of these 501, are experiencing pretty dramatic reductions at the level of 90% of overall population reducing. If you look at the map of the world, this effect is not even across the world. Part of this is sampling bias, that we know less about what's going on in some places, but part of it is actually, we think, real. A lot of the big impact happened in Central America and in South America. As you move along the graph here, as you go to the warmer colors, the severity of decline is larger. Okay? So this is an extinct bar right here. This is a highly impacted, and this is an impacted but impacted minimally, okay? So as you move to the right here on each of these graphs, you're moving towards extinction. We separated Brazil here from South America because there's some interesting dynamics going on that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but you can see that there are known declines on pretty much every continent in the world. There's a big hole here in Africa, which I think is probably primarily sampling bias and that we don't really have. Uh, what we're missing is actually assessment of what the population numbers were like before, okay? We know that BD is present there. Okay, so that's how bad it is. In, in categorizing how bad it is, we actually ran into some pretty common patterns in conservation, conservation biology, and that is that, I'm gonna focus on this first. This is, con these concentric circles are actually total species range size for the different 500 species that are in affected. And again, the warmer colors are higher rates of endangerment. And what you can see is that as you go towards the center of the circle, if you squint at this, you can see that the hotter colors are in the middle. And that, what that, all that means is that populations or species with smaller geographic ranges tend to be more endangered. Completely normal pattern, right, in conservation biology. Um, we also find that species that are actually more threatened tend to have narrower niches. In this case, we quantified elevational range, how far their range was up a side of a mountain, for example, and you can see that as you go to the more endangered side of this graph, that you have animals with smaller elevational ranges. 
Okay, so very common pattern if you're a habitat specialist of some sort or you have a small range, you're microendemic, you're more likely to be highly impacted uh, by something that changes in your environment. <laughs> okay, the second question is where did it come from? Um, and again, we worked with a very large number of people to actually answer this question, to create a phylogenetic tree for all the isolates that we had in all of our labs. Um, and the answer is this. And I'll walk you through this. This is a really busy phylogeny from the O'Hanlon paper. But basically, this is the root of the tree right here. And what you'll see is that there are a number of different lineages, which are going to become important here during my talk, that are first diverged at the base of the tree. Okay? So these are lineages of VD that are floating around. And then it turns out that they tend to be somewhat geographically restricted. Okay? At some point, this point right here, right there, for the owl, what happened is that we had the evolution of this really shallowly diverged clade that basically split, spread all over the world. That clade we call the global panzoatic lineage, and it is a lineage that is primarily responsible so, for a lot of the catastrophic declines that we see in frog communities throughout the world. Okay? So these lineages that are here at the base are going to become important because they actually come from specific places. This blue lineage right here actually is uh, restricted to Asia. This pink lineage is, is found in some places in Asia, but also is one of the lineages that is native or endemic to Brazil. We call this BD Brazil. This right here is the Cape lineage found in South Africa, and then the evolution of this large panzoatic and now globally distributed clade. OK, we can tell from the tree, not necessarily just from the tree, but from the distribution of genetic variation in these different lineages, that most of the genetic variation occurs in Asia, and that all the other continents are populated by lineages or types of BD that contain some sort of subset of the allelic diversity that is present there. So we infer from this, from these two pieces of data, that Asia is the origin or the center of diversification of BD as a whole, and then there's then been secondary global spread um, with the evolution of the global panzoatic lineage. So that's where we think it came from. OK, my lab has been working on BD in a number of different places. Uh, one of the nice things, it's not, there's nothing nice about BD, but <laughs> one of the convenient things in terms of studying disease ecology is that BD uh, in different continents has different dynamics going on. We're at different points, so to speak, sort of, uh, in terms of where uh, where we are relative to the invasion of the, the global panzoatic lineage, whether we have other lineages present in that place or not, these, enzo these endemic lineages at the base of the tree. So in North America, we now think that the fungus, that, that BD is what we call enzootic, meaning it has invaded, it has reached some sort of equilibrium with its host communities. Um, and now we see evidence of infection but it tends to not be this epizootic, right? And so it's not, we're, not in the, we're basically not in the pandemic phase of this invasion. So we do see seasonal outbreaks in different parts of the US, and there's some interesting patterns going on there. In Central America, working with my colleague Karen Lips, um, we actually witnessed the epizootic um, early on. Uh, we witnessed the demographic collapses, and we're now in this more equilibrium and zootic state. And in South America, we infer from looking at historical samples that we are now enzootic. And although we never witnessed it, there is good evidence for past demographic collapses. And of course, in South America, we have BD Brazil, that other lineage of, of uh, BD, which is, an, which is an interesting comparison. OK, so we're looking at a number of different things in these different places. And a lot of these studies involve um, studies of differential gene expression. So we've taken, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today, we've taken sort of a functional genetic re um, view of what can we say about the evolution and the interaction between this pathogen and all its hosts in these different places um, from the point of view of how hosts are reacting uh, to infection. We've done a number of different things that focus on the pathogen itself, what, are, what genes are the, are the pathogens secreting or, or expressing uh, in an infection? 
Uh, we've done a number of studies looking at the host variability and response, in this case looking for evidence of potential resistance or tolerance. And then we've also looked at different aspects of the environment that might alter the response of the host in terms of differential gene expression. So I'm going to tell you about two of those. The first one I'll tell you about is uh, this study here, which is I put under environment because this, in this particular study, we're looking at hosts, in this case salamanders, who are already infected with one batrachochytrium and then become secondarily infected with a second batrachochytrium. Okay, and this is actually important and timely because remember I told you B cell, the salamander specific batrachochytrium is not as far as we know in the wild here in, in North America, but a number of our salamanders, local salamanders, native salamanders already exist with BD infections. They, salamanders tend to tolerate BD infections quite well. But the question here is what happens if you're already infected and become secondarily infected with B cell? Which is a scenario that I think most people really do believe that it's not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. But when B cell arrives, uh, what is that interaction gonna look like? The second study I'll tell you about is a comparison of those different lineages. So working in Brazil with Tim and others, uh, we have discovered the distribution and coexistence of BD Brazil with the global panzootic lineage in Brazil. And so one of our questions was, for a native host, a Brazilian host, frog host, what is the functional response to these two lineages that are supposed to have different variolins? So what is going on there in terms of the host response? Okay, so I'll start with co-infection. All right, so the question here is, if a salamander becomes infected with BD and B cell together, if it's co-infected, what outcome do we predict? And what are the mechanisms leading to that outcome? So you can imagine, thinking about co-infection, that there are a couple possibilities. The first is that these two pathogens are really, really bad in combination, right? And maybe they interact, maybe they just overwhelm the host, maybe they collaborate, I mean, all sorts of things are possible. This would be a case of synergy and you would predict that the disease outcome would be more severe, right? The second situation, and one that is not unusual actually, is that the two pathogens are actually antagonistic, right? They're both skin pathogens, they both occupy the same tissue, uh, perhaps they compete with each other, they might actually actively compete with each other, in which case you might surprisingly see an antagonistic outcome, which would be a reduction in the disease severity, okay? So that's our main question, is what, what, what is it that happens? And can we tell from the point of the view of the salamander's expression of the new genes, what is, what is it that's actually happening? So uh, for this study, uh, we collaborated with Ana Longo, a colleague who's now at uh, University of Florida, and we looked at the gene expression of four different treatments in terms of experimental infections. We had salamanders that were infected only with BD, salamanders that were infected only with B cell, salamanders that were infected with both, um, and then controls which were sham infected, meaning they went through the same sham infection but didn't have actually any zoospores in, in that infection uh, process, okay? In her case, um, Anna was looking at mortality overall and you know the progression of disease, uh, and I'll show you that at the end. And we went in right at the end of the experiment and collected tissue from spleen and from skin um, and actually asked questions about the gene expression underlying the actual response. All right, so um, this, these are our first results. These are volcano plots. They're just a way to portray gene expression under different treatments. Every one of these little dots is a gene that is expressed as a result of the treatment. And all the dots that are colored either red are genes that are overexpressed relative to control, and then blue here are genes that are down regulated or underexpressed relative to control. Okay, so if you just look across these panels, the first thing we found is if you compare BD only infected salamanders to their controls, you see some overexpression of genes, not a lot. You see some underexpression of genes, even fewer. 
something's going on, not a, not a, doesn't seem like a very strong response, at least compared to other volcano plots we've looked at. If you infect only with B-cell, the salamander-specific pathogen, we start seeing some more action. And in this case, what you see is actually overexpression of a larger number of genes than we had with BD alone, okay? So something here is going on. Maybe not surprising given that this is actually a salamander-specific pathogen, right? And then our main hint that something was going on was this. And this is co-infected versus control, and you can see that the salamander just goes nuts, right? So there's a huge amount of overexpressed genes and an even larger amount of underexpressed genes relative to the control. Okay, we can query these genes and ask what are they doing? Functionally, what do they do? And um, I'll walk you through this, but basically the two, and I'm only going to show you co-infected versus control here because I think that's the more interesting comparison. So these guys here in yellow are the controls. These guys here in blue are the co-infected individuals. And this heat map shows you the genes that are in both directions. Towards the green direction, they're basically lower in expression relative to control. And towards the purple direction here, they're higher in expression to control. And you can see that these two treatment groups are almost exact mirror images of each other, right? So this is what's happening when you're not infected. And look at what happens when you are infected. It's like mirror image. Okay, what are these genes? So if you look up here at these that are overexpressed or over expressed, and you categorize them according to function, what we found is that these are basically genes that have to do with some level of uh, humoral response. This is some level of adaptive immune response. We find groups of genes that have to do with MHC antigen presentation, which is part of the pathway leading to antibody production. You also find a number of genes, part of this large group called the cytokine signaling. This is a group of genes that are uh, basically involved with inflammation and inflammatory response. Exactly what you would expect, right, given some form of immune response going on. However, if you look down here at the genes that are underexpressed on the green side of things, Three, a large proportion of the genes in this part of the heat map are actually part, and including the three most highly differentially expressed genes in the whole study, were part of this thing called complement. And complement is uh, part of the innate immunity. It's basically sort of the first line of response that you would expect from an infected organism in terms of its you know, first line of defense innate immune system. Okay, so there's something going on there that has to do with the innate immunity. We queried, we queried this further queried this further, looking at uh, what they call gene ontology categories, sort of groups of genes that have similar function. And what we found is that these groups of genes here, these GO names, are all overrepresented in these, in these. A lot of these have to do with complement, as I just said, regulation of complement, regulation of protein activation. All of this has to do with that immune, innate immune system. However, we also did find a GO category here which has to do with humoral immune response. And that's the adaptive part of immunity, right? The part of immunity that has to do with the secondary response and the production of antibodies, and presumably the potential at that point to actually um, have some sort of response that was adaptive in terms of um, tolerance or reversal of the infection, okay? All right, so what's happening here, it looks like, is that you have, in some cases of genes, um, upregulation that would seem consistent with response, immunogenomic response to an infection, but also a large decrease, not only in the innate, but also in the humoral response. And we can pick out particular genes. I just picked out three immune genes here from the skin, and I'm not showing you responses from the spleen because the patterns were almost exactly the same. Uh, and you can see the downregulation of these critical immune genes in both tissues. So here I have the control. BD only, BSAL only, and co-infected in that order. And you can see that the controls are always lower no matter what the gene. If we look at BD only, there's an increase in the expression of these particular critical genes. If you go BSAL, even higher. And then if you go to the co-infected one, in almost all cases, it's lower than BSAL alone. 
So this is some form of dampening, dampening of the response of these critical genes. And where does that come from? So there are a couple possibilities, which we couldn't distinguish in this particular study. It could be that this is a host-directed response and it's just, the host is just overwhelmed. That's one possibility. It could be that the managing both pathogens, this is, this is what happens in terms of communication of the immune response to both pathogens. It could also be that the pathogen is mediating some form of immunosuppression. And there is some evidence that this happens with BD, although I don't think it's been shown with B cell yet, uh, but it's, it's definitely possible that the pathogen is dampening these critical response genes as a form of the infection dynamic, right? Okay, the reason we can't really say much more about what is going on here is because all these animals were taken at the terminal point of the experiment. So everybody was pretty much infected, in some cases highly infected. Um, some of them were actually moribund at the time that we sampled this. And so to actually get at this, it's gonna be important to actually look at a time series of what's going on in terms of immune response. Just to conclude this study, though, there does seem to be some sort of suppression, and Anna's survival data actually do show that, okay? So these are her different controls. I only, we only sequenced um, BD, B-Sal, and co-infected these first three lines. She also did other experiments where she altered the order of infection of the two, um, uh, of the two uh, pathogens. I, Still to this day, every time I show this graph, I can't believe we didn't sequence these two, but somehow we just didn't. Maybe it was money, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but in any event, uh, we have the results for BD, B-Sal, and for the co-infected. And you can see that BD alone, salamanders seem to survive BD infections very well. B-Sal alone already means a relatively high degree of mortality compared to BD, almost 50% uh, probability of mortality or probability of survival. And then when you get to BD and B cell co-infected, we're down to less than 20% probability of survival. Okay, so this is a pretty serious decrease in survival probability um, in a situation of co-infection, which is exactly what we expect to happen once B cell arrives um, to North America. All right, okay. So my second study has to do with trying to figure out two things now. Um, is there something about I'm not gonna talk about B-Sal anymore. I'm gonna focus on frogs and BD. And the second question was trying to get at this question of what is happening temporally during the course of infection and infection response. And the, a secondary question for this study was, we wanted to know if there's something special about the global panzootic lineage that is supposed to be this hypervirulent thing compared to these other lineages that are more geographically restricted um, and, you know, seem to be enzootic, like they're, they're from particular places. And because of our work in Brazil, we ended up focusing on BD Brazil, members of the, this little pink lineage here, and then also using BDGPL from Brazil as a comparison. And in this case, uh, because we wanted a local host, we uh, chose this species here, the pumpkin toadlet. It's a native of the uh, Atlantic coastal forest of Brazil. It is a susceptible species. And we did another infection experiment, this time focusing on these two lineages. Okay, so what are the predictions here? Well, the prediction is if there is something about evolving, perhaps in the presence of BD Brazil as a host, you might expect, if there is coevolution going on, that BD Brazil would actually cause less disease severity in pumpkin toad. Alternatively, if BDGPL really is hy this hypervirulent evolved thing that spread all over the world and it secondarily arrived in Brazil, you might expect that hosts that have not evolved in the presence of that particular species uh, would develop higher disease severity. So that was the hypothesis we had going in. We wanted to differentiate not only between these two lineages, but we also wanted to differentiate across tissues between different time points in the infection process. Okay, because if these two things are acting differently, it could be simply that they have different virulence, which is one potential mechanism. The other is that they actually either suppress or overwhelm 
the host immune system in different ways at different points during infection. So that's what we were trying to get at, okay? So our, our experimental design here was that we would infect everybody, large groups, and then we had controls, obviously, and then we would sample individuals with the two different lineages at three different points in time, okay? Early, mid, and late infection. All right, so in this case, I'm gonna show you the outcome of the infection experiment right off the bat. These are all pumpkin toadlets infected with these two lineages or a control. And you can see that the BD, Brazil, and the control are up here with relatively high survival probability. And that BD GPL, from Brazil actually does kill pumpkin toadlets, this yellow line, at a slightly higher rate. It's not as extreme as in the other experiment, but there is a significant difference between this yellow line and the other two. Interestingly, if you, we swabbed and, and quantified uh, the number of zoospores on the skin of these hosts during the course of infection, and over the 15-day post-infection period, what you see is that the number of zoospores, the number of Infect infective agents in the skin of the frogs, which were swabbed systematically, rapidly goes up, it reaches a peak, and for DGPL, it stays really high, and for BD Brazil, it never goes as high, and, as, and it tapers off or equilibrates at a lower potential load, okay? So this was our first clue that there's something going on here, not only in terms of the lineages, right? Well, in terms of the lineages, not only in terms of the cause for mortality, but also in terms of the dynamics that are going on in the skin. So we chose two days post-infection as our early um, uh, tissue collection. We chose middle of the experiment at basically seven days as our mid, and then we chose this plateau here, this equilibrium in terms of the dynamics of DD in the skin as our late term. Okay. All right. Okay. So what did we find? So. Let's see. All right, in purple here is BD Brazil, in yellow is BD GPL, the same host this time, right? What you can see, this is early, this is mid, and this is late. And what you can see is as you go from early to mid to late infection stages, the total number of genes that are differentially expressed goes up. But it doesn't go up equally. What happens is that BD Brazil infected toads express a number of different genes in early and mid stages, and then they go crazy when they're just about to die at the late stage. BD Brazil, the local endemic strain of BD, actually does the opposite. It starts off with some expression early on, right at the beginning, day two, and then it has its maximal expression uh, at the mid-infection period, and then it reduces in, in expression, okay? If you quantify all the differentially expressed genes, that are in, this, in these Venn diagrams, what you end up seeing is here's early, mid, and late, and the two colors represent the two different lineages, infection by the two different BD lineages, and you see the exact same pattern. Basically, there's a little bit of expression early on by both lineages. By mid-infection, BD Brazil is differentially expressing, causing the host to differentially express a whole bunch of genes. Um, that seems to resolve itself, and then in late infection, it's where the BD Brazil, I'm sorry, where the BD GPL actually has expression in both directions, both up and down, okay? So many more genes in response to GPL, and uh, a much more dramatic variance in the expression of genes um, based, on, based on that graph. If we look at what these genes are, uh, not surprisingly, they have a number of different roles, but a lot of these roles are actually immunogenomic. They're immune genes, immune pathway genes. So again, this is BD Brazil up here in this panel, and this is the global panzootic lineage, the hypervirulent one in this panel. And you can see if we look at just these immune genes, early, mid, and late, and you can see that most of the action, all of the action in the immune gene go categories are in the mid-infection period, okay? So it's almost like nothing's happening early with BD Brazil. It's like, yeah, you're there, I know you. And then the frog mounts an immune response in these immune categories, and then it resolves itself, right? 
If you look at BGGPL, we have a number of early, that's the lighter colors here, we have a number of early expressed uh, immune GO category genes, and then we have a number of mid, and then we have a really, really large number of um, uh, late expressed genes that all have to do with sort of collagen and keratin, which are, all, of course, the skin components that are being, um, that are being disturbed in the, in the skin of the infected frog. Okay, so very different profiles, temporal profiles, in terms of responses of the two hosts. So this is interesting to us because it means that there's two different things going on, right? In frogs infected, the same host infected with VD Brazil successfully mounts an immune system at a approximately appropriate time in terms of response, resolves that, resolves that infection, and continues to exist and survive even with zoospores in their skin. Okay? Remember the plateau was lower, but they still had zoospores in their skin? This is a, this is a signature of tolerance. Okay? So somehow by mounting this immune response and responding at the appropriate time and with the appropriate, presumably, immune pathways, they're actually getting to the point where they can minimize the damage of the pathogen in their skin and not basically become, you know, become past the point where they can recover. Whereas the same host infected with the global panzoatic lineage has a delayed response. There's some early response. There's some medium response, but really they only go crazy in terms of light, late infection uh, differential gene expression. And so this is, again, a signature of some form, perhaps, of immunosuppression, where the response, once it comes, it's there, but the response, once it comes, it's too little, too late. And so we have a situation of infection with higher mortality. That's how, that's what we think is going on here. All right, is there any questions on any of this so far? Okay. I have okay. a question. Yeah. So is this population naive to either or both of the, of the, the lineages there? Um, the, been the, before. the species has been exposed before. We tested, uh, we swabbed animals collected from the wild that we brought in for the experiment and actually tested whether they were positive or negative for BD. And then we used everybody in the experiment whether they were positive or not, but we took the uh, original status of BD infection, yes or no, into account in terms of the significance of the mortality. And it turns out that having an infection I guess, you know, the population has been exposed, so I think enough individuals in the population probably have been exposed and either cleared or not the infection that it came out in the wash. There was no significant effect of infection at the time of capture. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, so I told you a little bit about sort of the plight of frogs and places and what's going on in terms of the diversity not only of BD and its function but hosts and their response. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit more of some of the efforts we've been trying to do to look at sort of post-decline um, potential survival or rediscovery of some of the species that have actually been affected. So uh, Brazil has one of the highest amphibian diversity in terms of number of species in the world. There are more than a thousand species. A lot of them are actually located in the Atlantic coastal forest, which is the historical distribution is shown here in green. This is the current distribution of undisturbed uh, Atlantic coastal forest in this picture. So you can see the difference. Only a certain, a relatively small percentage of the habitat re remains. Um, so telling you this just to point out that we know that BD exists in Brazil and that BDGPL has a, neg a particularly negative effect on hosts of frogs uh, from the local fauna, but there are a lot of other different um, aspects to amphibian declines that are out there. So nobody's negate, nobody's saying this is only disease, okay? All right, um, so we decided to use the Atlantic Coastal Forest as a, te a, a test case for trying to rediscover any species that were disappeared. Um, because there's a lot of documentation from people who have done surveys in different parts of the Atlantic Coastal Forest since the 1970s and actually documenting some of these declines. So these are just little pieces of papers, little pieces of text from papers that are published. And you can see in a number of different places that have been intensively surveyed, they talk about drastic population reductions, declines. You read these 
heart-wrenching stories of national parks that are completely undisturbed, where researchers say, but when I came here in the 1960s, the, car the floor was carpeted with brachycephalus, and you couldn't step but one meter without stepping on one, and now they're gone, right? So I think enough of this is evident from the published literature that we decided that this was the place to actually do this study. Okay, so what we did was comb all this literature. Uh, we looked at a bunch of uh, theses that had done sort of community surveys in the past and theses that have done community surveys more recently and compared those. And we came up with 30 species at six different localities. And this is just our table with the six different localities. Most of them are actually national or state parks. Um, and we put all these species into three different endangerment categories. The first category was that the species had been reported as declined, meaning it used to be there and it's still there, but we don't see it as often as we used to. The second is that the species is locally extinct, lo locally disappeared, okay? So that means that the species was there. Uh, we know it's still elsewhere in its range, but at this particular point, we can find it not, not anymore for at least eight years. I think that was our cutoff. And then the last one was species that were completely disappeared meaning they're gone from here and they're gone from their range and nobody has seen them for a long time, okay? And we chose these three levels because of course there are different predictions here in terms of who you expect to detect and we actually wanted to test our ability to find uh, species in these different categories. If eDNA is gonna be useful to rediscover lost species, it would be useful to know um, how gone they have to be before you don't find them anymore, right? All right, so here's, um, the localities of all our different uh, sampling places, the six sampling sites. Uh, I think everybody must be somewhat familiar with environmental DNA, but basically this is the process of trying to capture DNA from the environment. With frogs, it's actually very convenient because frogs are mostly aquatic and survey of eDNA in aquatic environments is, is a lot easier than in non-aquatic environments. Uh, so basically, we went around to all these six places and sampled the habitats that these animals would be in. This is the most beautiful field work I've done with the least amount of actual frog encounters <laughs> because all we did was filter water for like a month and a half. So you, what you do is you filter liters and liters of water from whatever habitat the frog was in that you are looking for. In our case, they were mostly, mostly river and stream species. We had a, one pond species, which I'll talk, tell you about in a second. You pass them through this capsule you then take the capsule back to a clean room, an ancient DNA room. If you have one, you extract the DNA from it, and then you have total DNA from all the DNA that was in that sample. We amplified a particular chunk of the 12S gene, so we were using metabarcodes, and then we made a sequence reference database for every species we were looking for and all their congeners um, that were known to be in the area. Okay, so if we were looking for a CNAX, whatever, musicus, then we would get all the CNAX that were in that place and get the barcodes for comparison with what came out of the, in, the filtered DNA. You then put this through a big sequencing, get millions of sequences, you parse them out, throw everything out that is human, pig, cow, or chicken, and then you uh, basically reduce it to everything that's botrachia, and then you compare each one of those taxonomically to the metabar. Okay, you can probably, if you're sitting out there thinking, oh, you're looking at some extinct species, you're probably already thinking, how did you get them into the sequence reference database? And you're right, you can't, unless you go to ancient DNA, unless you go to museums, you can't get this a metabarcode unless you have a tissue sample from that animal before it became extinct. So working with um, uh, Mike and Alida, who is a, a scientist uh, who spent some time in Germany actually trying to do recovery of, of DNA from formalin fixed specimens, we were actually able to get, of our four species that were completely disappeared, we were actually able to get metabarcodes for two of them from museum specimens, but we failed from the other two. Okay, so we tried the, we tried the museum specimen um, effort and were successful to some extent. So for the ones that we couldn't get tissues from the museum, we found every single other species in that genus, whether it was in that locality or not, to see if we could get as close as a genus if we detected that particular disappeared species. So that was the sort of level of detail to which we went to try to match these barcodes. Okay, let me see how my time's doing. Okay, I'm gonna go fast here. 
All right, here's a first locality, Estacion Biologica Boracea, well surveyed in the 1960s. We had 12 uh, samples, filtered samples. We found 40 frog molecular ox uh, organismal tox taxonomic units, meaning we knew they were frogs. Uh, we had 21 species represented in those 40 samples, and none of them matched our disappeared species. Okay. All right. Um, Itachiaia, again, a national park. We had 16 samples. We found 20 things that matched frogs. Those were 13 different species. We found two species, both hylodes, that were on our list of 30. All right. Saha uh, da Bocaina, we had five samples, 19 frog species, 15 species of frogs from those 19 MOTUs, and one of them was Megalosia. And Megalosia from this locality is known only from the type specimen and it hasn't been seen since 1973. Okay, so it was one of our disappeared species. Uh, this was an interesting one, Saha du Sipa. This animal had not been seen since 1973. We happened to hit a day after a rainy night. This is a pond breeder, not a stream breeder. And so we had like seven ponds to choose from. We had three capsules and we chose three ponds and we had 12 OTUs, eight different species that were known to be in that area, and none of them actually matched the species Cenex lima. In the course of filtering water, we actually heard this guy calling, and we found an actual individual in one of the three ponds that we did not sample. <laughs> All right, uh, Santa Teresa in uh, Rio de Janeiro, they had 14 different capsules. Here we actually hit um, a, a number of hits. We had 20 different species represented in our molecular barcodes, and Prosodactylus, Hylodes, Vitra, Ron, and Phasma Hyla were all present in, in those particular samples. And then here's the last one. This is uh, Ceja dos Orgos, and um, we had 12 different samples, and we found two of the different species. So let me show you real quickly how this ended up uh, falling out. Here are all the species that we uh, surveyed for in environmental DNA. Of the seven species that we actually found in our molecular samples, four of them, you sort of would have predicted this, four of them, the majority were actually declining, meaning they're known to still be there, so of course we found them, uh, but it was great to find them. Two of them are locally disappeared, but we rediscovered them at the place where they disappeared. So what this indicates is that they're there, and we know they're elsewhere, must just be at very, very low non-detectable levels, right? And then we found this one disappeared species. Unfortunately, this particular species, Megalosia bocainensis, is this one of the species for which we couldn't get ancient DNA from the museum specimen. And in fact, what happened is that it only exists as a type, and we couldn't get permission to destructively sample the type specimen, right? We had every other Megalosia in the database, and there are no other megalosia known from that particular mountain range, at least currently, so we are presuming that that is, you know, by inference, the species that was particularly there for which, we don't have, for which we don't have a barcode. We can argue whether this is a success or not. <laughs> and certainly, there were some interesting findings, but I am the first to admit that finding replicates of a metabarcode, a 12S gene in an environmental sample doesn't tell us really anything about the health of the situation or anything else. What it does tell us is that there's some room for actually looking for um, species that might have disappeared, and uh, maybe combining this with other methods uh, would be a good way to go in the future. So, all right, great. I'm gonna end there. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that thanks for listening. I talked mostly about one particular uh, type of study that we goes on in our lab that has to do more on the conservation side. Uh, next time I come back, I'll talk a little bit more about diversification and mating strategies in frogs. Uh, and I just want to end by thanking uh, my eDNA collaborators, my disease ecology co collaborators, and my funding sources. And thank you. <laughs> and I have about seven minutes for questions, I think. Okay. So uh, what percentage of the known amphibian community did you get in each of your in your samples on average that was you know that 
previously been documented in it, so maybe at least in the last you know so many years. Yeah. And also, given that we know that there's already a detection probability issue, in what, how many cases did you find it hits on frogs that were known to be widespread elsewhere outside of your focal locality, but that were you know first records for a particular site based on the eDNA approach? Uh, so we didn't discover anything new. We didn't find a new frog that hadn't been reported from there. So that's the answer to that. Our database, I, th I can't remember the exact number, but it was in the 90s. I think we had 95 to 96% of all species. And we, ordered, we tiered it, right? So we, we tried to get a tissue sample from that locality. If we couldn't get a tissue sample from that locality, we tried to get a tissue sample from the species from somewhere else in the range that wasn't too far. If we couldn't get that, then we would just get a tissue sample from that species somewhere else in the range. And if we couldn't then get that, then we were down to the level of you know, congeners, right? We would just add anybody we could in that particular genus if we couldn't get the, the specific point. So a lot of what happened here was assembly of this database, the reference database. And that's the only reason we could do that is because these six localities that we chose are actually some of the best explored frog community localities in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier to look for one particular thing for which you have a metabarcode than to look for a number of different things and then associate them to community members. Yeah. Yvonne. Were the most uh, common frog species the most uh, overrepresented? I mean, the relationship to like local levels? There's a rough relationship, yeah. So uh, things that are there everywhere that still persist, they were a large part. And this is actually part of the problem, right, when you do this kind of thing at a community level because Everything that's there is so overrepresenting the environmental DNA content that you end up picking up a lot of the common things, plus the humans, the cows, the chickens. I mean, if you look at in the supplementary material of the paper, we show the decline in number of informative uh, meta barcodes for what we were looking for, and it goes from you know 50 million to basically I don't know, 20. I mean, it's, incre it's incredible how, how much of it is stuff that we already knew was there. So it's a, that's one of the limitations of the method. If we're talking about one, if we're talking about one DNA sequence in one you know, sequencing PCR reaction, that's difficult. So what we did actually, I didn't mention this, but every DNA sample that was extracted from a filter got, um, there were four different replicates from the filter extractions, because we cut the filter in four, and then we did 12 PCRs off of every quarter of the filter, 12, and then those got barcoded individually, so we could look at the number of replicates out of the 12 PCRs. So megalosia, for example, when you look at, when you look at it, if, you, if I had had one sequence out of one quarter of the filter in one PCR, I would have been like, mm, but it was there. It was like multiple sequences, not 100, but like 12, 14 out of every quarter and out of multiple replicates of the 12. So that's another sort of step you need to go to in terms of you know, making certain you don't. The burden of proof of this kind of stuff really kind of freaked me out. You know, it's like, <laughs> because it's like, all right, this is important, right? I'm telling somebody that megalosia is still here. Somebody might go spend money on this, and I need to be sure, right? So the burden of proof is like, in, in making sure that you don't have false positives, contamination, um, you know, is kind of a big deal. So. Kelly, uh, oh, Yeah, we, well, this is the first that we know of it, and that is that, you know, BG Brazil has been there a long time, and so have the frogs, right? So, and there's definitely a different temporal pattern. It could be that BG Brazil just is overall less virulent, right. and it could be that that lower virulence is because of coevolution. So you just can't tell yet. Like I can't tell that. Yeah. Yeah, Gideon. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. I was curious, this is maybe a little morbid, but do you know anything about um, like the 
expression profile of just dying frogs that aren't necessarily yeah. dying from pitchery. Yep. Um, and you know, do you identify, like, is this a, a frog that's being killed by pitchery itself, or is this like what frogs do when they die? Yeah. So this is why we did the temporal series, because sure. everybody's like, well, this must be some sort of late stage morbidity immunopathology. I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of immune, go category enriched immune groups there. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it's completely devoid, I don't think it's just dying, but there's a lot of dying there, right? <laughs> so, so this is why the temporal series, and from this point on actually, pretty much if you don't do something temporal, you're not gonna be getting at what are the main patterns are. And nobody has done that to this point. So I think from this point forward, we're gonna have to start paying a lot more attention to stages of disease development. Yeah. But good point. That's, that's one of the criticisms that we always have. It's like, this is a morbid frog. How can you expect anything to be? Did you um, sample the same host for the time? Yeah, that was all black staphylococcus. You, that, the skin swabs was what gave us that plateau in the BD load. So we swabbed the entire time mm -hmm. until sampling. So we had like, I don't know, 20 of each, and then we would take you know a third, a third, and a third at the different time points. But they were all infected at the same point, they were all infected the same way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how long does DNA hang around in water? That's a great question. And people are actually looking at that, and it, it varies between ponds and streams, and it varies, um, uh, with all sorts of abiotic factors. So up here in the, in, in, temperate, in the temperate zone, some of the fish people are actually showing experimentally that if you put cages of fish in streams, you can actually, and then remove them, um, you can actually detect DNA for, I think it's on the order of two to three weeks, sometimes even longer, which is surprising. And the invasive species biology people actually need to know this because, right, if you find an invasive species <coughs> DNA, when, when was it last there? Um, the tropics, there's less, there's less work in the tropics experimentally in terms of putting caged animals and then, and then, and then, you know, sampling for it. So, but there have been experiments with temperature, flow, yeah, it's. But it's on the order of weeks, it sounds like, from what you know. At least up here from the experimental work. But occupancy is everything, right? So the pond example where we found the Cenox, I mean, we, we were there and these ponds were discontinuous. It had rained, I imagine at some point they all flooded and then maybe they didn't all com completely connect and we just didn't have the right one, right? So, yeah. All right, well I think we're gonna draw this to a conclusion and ask anyone who wants to stick around for the, to say for the reception, Kelly will stay here. Yeah. Um, and I wanna thank you again for coming. Thank you, thanks everyone.